This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and today I have a man that is a legend in the Middle East and in Alberta. He's wrestled for WWE. He was one of the trainers for for Matt Rats. He was one of the one of the guys that first trained me how to lock up. Uh, he's owned his own wrestling company, and now he has the top training school in Calgary. He used to have a training school in Dubai. Is working on one in Lebanon too. None other than the beast from the Middle East, Ali. How are you doing today, sir? Man, I'm doing amazing. We got snow on the ground, but it's a sunny day, so so I can't complain, bro. Let's go inside. Workhorse Fitness Center, and and you've had Bruce Hart training in there. You've had uh, Gamma Singh and some Impact wrestlers. Just a top-notch facility. Uh, Champagne Jerry Morrow came in. Fandango came in and gave our uh, schooled our students. So that was an absolute pleasure. Reversal's been here. Uh, um, Silas Young has been here. Harry Smith works out here regularly. The Billington boys are always around. You can catch the Voros twins here too when they're doing shows for RCW. So this is kind of our ring area here. A couple of 18 footers, crash pad. And, and then out here, we go into the gym area. and then to the WFPC office. And this is where the magic starts. Yeah, that's it. Uh around how much does that facility cost to put all that together that's that's amazing you know we got uh it's pretty serious we got a uh, steam room we got stand-up tanning beds we got a protein bar with like really healthy uh rice bowls and chicken and steak wraps and stuff we got massage therapists physiotherapists uh the calgary stampeders cfl team works out here and uh, some of the uh, Ed uh, former Edmonton Eskimos, now Edmonton Elks, uh, work out here. So it's really nice to be. And then you got the pro bodybuilder, uh, pro bodybuilders that come in here uh, and prep prep for the uh, chat for their championships. And uh, and then all the WWE and AEW and Impact and and Ring of Honor and MLW and even we're getting these workers from uh, from uh, uh, AAA. Uh, in Mexico, and it's just like, I mean, our students are just thrilled that all these stars are around them all the time. And uh, I can't complain. And we try to treat them with a little bit of respect. You know, uh, Hannibal, you know, like if you can't pull out a protein shake or a rice bowl for a WWE veteran who's, you know, sweat, blood, and tears in that ring, and, or drive him to the airport or to his hotel room and pick him up for a workout, then I don't think you should be in this business, my opinion. Now, I notice you're promoting or you have something to do with the uh, the event at the Pavilion in February. Uh, I think Bret Hart's kids had something to do with the, the Halloween show at the Victoria Pavilion where Stampede Wrestling used to run back in October. What's your involvement with that? Just, just sending talent to be on those shows or... Well, you know what? That is a dear, dear friend of ours and talented SOB by the name of uh, Mo Jabari, a.k.a. Kid Chocolate. And uh, he's uh, working now in partnership with Dallas and Blade, Bret Hart's kids. And they've launched uh, Dungeon Wrestling and absolutely, I mean, they get all the, you know, the Brian Pillman Jr. and Harry Smith and the Billington boys and the Bollywood boys and Rohan and... Uh, and uh, Chris Masters and Nick Aldis and Raj Singh and Chris, the Aussie legend Knight, like they just, the whole card is stacked. I mean, and they're, they're, they're the last two shows that we, we attended, our students uh, go down there and assist and pay their dues and set up and, and get people coffee and whatever the hell they need. 
um, and it was just, I mean, just an amazing, amazing show. So, um, yeah, we're, we're happy to have Mo. You know, he was trained by our head coach, Chris, the Aussie legend Knight and uh, Mo Jabari. Just a lovely human being and just killing it out there with, with wrestling almost on uh, Raw and then a AEW. And it's just like he's just killing it out there. And um, so uh, we, I mean, he's here and he sees the, the kind of uh, talent that we're producing. And I tell him, you're not pro wrestlers, you're sports entertainers. Get it through your head. You're here to put on a performance or go home. Uh, and they do. Uh, the proof is in the pudding, you know, like we've got Mars, that's just uh, the specialist killing it out there, and Isaac Takeover, and a young man from uh, from Ottawa, Canada, Ottawa, London, Bernard, I just, I mean, but when, you, when you're under the tutelage of the Aussie legend and Raj Singh, I mean, what, what more could you ask for? You know, I just sit back and watch. I, I, I say to the students, so I'm not a coach, that is a coach. That is a coach who understands um this industry so just i mean what can i say i got lucky gift from god one thing you were telling me about uh, the other day when we were talking on the phone is you actually have places for students to stay there too you don't you don't have to make them fend for themselves right there's different homes where uh, you'll hook them up with if they come out there to train yeah, we have a housing facility. We even provide transportations if they require, because we get a lot of students overseas from France and London, uh, England and stuff. Um, so we do provide housing, uh, supervised housing. So, you know, there's there's rules, there's lights out, there's, you know, because uh, parents are entrusting their, you know, sometimes 17 and 18 year old kids that have never been out of their uh, city or, or, or town or, or province. Uh, and they're coming here, so uh, the place is uh, is supervised. It's, you know, these kids they go up together to the RCW and the dungeon shows where they assist, and and some of the other promotions as well. I'm, I'm not just, uh, but these two are, are are really work closely with us uh, in uh, in providing our talent with opportunities to debut in front of a live audience, and we're absolutely most grateful for that. So there's housing and. And meal prep, meal preps. We give them a training schedule. It's like a full-on program. You know, if you're in it you're with us, you're in it to win it, and you're seven days a week. I mean, we have some students that come here at 10, uh, uh, 10, 12 o'clock uh, in the uh, morning, and don't leave till 10, 12 o'clock at night. I'm like, how do you spend 10 hours in a facility? And you know, they hit the tanning, they hit the steam room, they get a, they get a meal, they jump in the ring, they get on the weights, and it's just like, these guys are here to to succeed that's it so um and we don't you know i i mean i tell these guys um and i hate to you know uh, sorry to, to to jump in like this but i tell them you know um don't be fooled by any school who says to you we have connections there's no connections in this business there's your hard work so don't ever believe that somebody can call somebody in some federation and get you a job you got to earn it yourself, right? So I tell them right off the hop. And, and and also don't be fooled by any school who's got a promotion who says, oh, at the end of the three months, you're going to be in a show. We guarantee it, whether you suck ass or not. No, we train you that after three months, if you put in the effort, that you'll be able to work for any promotion anywhere in the world. And I'll tell you something else, Mr. Hannibal. We go back a long way. And I've always respected you and what you've done and, and, and how you've taken control of your life. And I, and I, like, to, and I like to think that I model mine uh, after yours. And um, our students are having main event matches. I kid you not, as God is my witness, before they're finished the training program. I'm like, how is that even possible? I thought I was hot shit. I guess not. Uh, so these, uh, these guys today, as opposed to 20... And 30 years ago they're killing it man they're just uh but we, but we've evolved the sport you know and i don't mean that we've re reinvented the wheel but we've taken the um we've taken this industry back to where it needs to be where it is a real fight so yeah good stuff now, at one point in time, WWE was looking at you, and it was around the same time they hired Mohammed Hassan that you were getting 
your tryouts. How did they uh, hook you up with those tryouts? And I know that September 11th, unfortunately, had something to do with your your contract not working out. Um, but I heard I heard you had very good reaction at your your tryouts in, in Calgary, and there was actually fans cheering for you and stuff for your dark matches. You know, you know, it was uh, the highlight of my life. And, uh, and you know what, I cherish it and I love it and I'm glad that I did it and I have no regrets, you know, of where I am today. And I didn't, you know, not reaching that platform that I, that I thought, you know, under, you know, I was trained by Ted Hart. I mean, could you ask for any, but I mean, that's it. There, there's Ted and then you go down a hundred steps and then everybody else starts there as far as talent's concerned. Um, so I thought I would I would do uh, huge things in this industry. Um, I, I I trained quick. I was in the ring with you. Remember Mad Dog McFly, Mike Nielsen, and and Aiden Pringle, and all these guys. And Natty was there. And you know we're talking over twenty years ago. And Ted was just a kid. And Harry was there. And and uh, and TJ was there. And and and. Uh, uh, Jack Evans and I mean like and so I was and I'm an old man like I'm almost 30 years old and these guys are just like teenagers um, so and Ted was what I loved about Ted he encouraged you to be creative you know when I do a hip toss I wouldn't I wouldn't do it to my to drop him on his back I would do it to my belly so both of us were coming crashing down and Ted would just say beautiful you know and that guy would he jump in the ring and he'd do half a dozen moves that had never been done before. And I'm like, what the hell? This guy's incredible. It was absolutely incredible being uh, around him when he was, you know, just evolving and, and becoming the wrestler that you know him to be. Um, but I wrestled, I ended up wrestling about 15 matches. And I said, you know what? I had a match with this stiff prick named Bill the Butcher Yates. You remember him. And I just sent it to head of talent relations. Kevin Kelly at the time was uh, was there, and uh, I'm I'm going into a tanning salon, and I got about 15 matches. I'm, I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing, and I wasn't a fan of the sport. Hey, I had like I I boxed as a kid. I had about 33 amateur fights. Um, I never watched it. As a matter of fact, you know what happened to me, is the wrestlers used to come into our boxing club, and uh, use our ring, and I'm like, oh, these mother, they're. And I couldn't believe it, you know, so that a lot of the things that I saw happen was like kind of ruined it for me. So I grew up, you know, uh, training for the UFC and uh, at uh, 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 Terry and Jiu Jitsu in, in uh, back east with Johnny Terry and, and then blew up my shoulder and thought that that my, my professional career was over. But I um, so uh, let me back up a minute. So I'm I'm I'm. About 30 years old, I'm going to say, taking business administration with a major in marketing. And I'm working out at BJ's gym, Ted's dad's old gym. And I'm playing basketball outside, you know. And I, you know, had no interest in wrestling. They had a wrestling ring upstairs, but I never attended. And Ted comes up to me and says, uh, hey, Ali, how's it going? And I knew he was the owner's son. I said, good, Ted, how are you? He said, good. He said, you've got a good look. He goes, um, do you uh, ever wrestle before in high school? I said, no. He said, you watch it on TV? I said, I got to be honest with you, bro. No, I don't. And he said, uh, well, what if I let you try it for free for two weeks? Would you give it a shot? Well, I said, sure, why not? And I remember after Hannibal, after I think it was, I, I, I couldn't be wrong. I'm old. I'm over 50 now. But um, I remember when I was in the ring with McFly, whatever we were working on, Ted had put his hand up to his face and whispered something to TJ, who were standing and kind of coaching uh, from outside the ring. And he said something, and as he pulled his hand away, he was smiling, and he was nodding in his head. And immediately I thought, this son of a bitch has got something. That's what I thought he was saying, like, this guy's got something. So needless to say, my first match under a mask, I was so bad that McFly, Mad Dog McFly, told me this about 15 years later. He goes, you want to know how much you sucked your first match? I said, what? He said, the promoter stood at the back of the building. I don't know if this is true or not, right? But this is what he told me. And he went like this. Get 
this clown out of my ring. And I was under a hood and I couldn't breathe and I was dying. And I, I, you know, <laughs> I swear to God, there was these chairs that were welded together like an airport street together. And I was literally putting my hands down and getting thrown into these chairs and trying to knock myself out because I couldn't get this mask off and I couldn't breathe. <sighs> the worst experience of my life, man. I don't think anybody has ever had a worse first match. Like to feel like you are dying, you can't get this thing off and you're trying to knock yourself out. <sighs> Mental is what you have to be. Um, so to make a long story short, I send this five minute match to uh, Kevin Kelly and I'm about to go into a tanning salon. Remember, I was born in Edmonton. I'm whiter than you are. This is a tan. And, and I'm about to go into this tanning salon by my house in Forest Lawn, Calgary. And uh, I look and it's WWF. I answer the phone, my heart's pumping, right? He says, hi, Ali, this is Kevin Kelly, Talent Relations. I said, hey, Kevin, how are you? He said, good. Um, I just watched your match. And I said, and? And he goes, and I kid you not, right? I have no reason to brag, I don't wrestle, I'm not trying to get a job. Uh, you can kiss my ass as far as I'm concerned. And, and, and I'll say this, God forgive me if I'm mistaken, my memory, I'm old, but he says, wow, you bring wrestling to a new level of intensity. I said, what did this guy just say? I said, what? He said, Ali, I want you to come out in front of 60,000 fans at the Oakland Alameda Coliseum in Oakland, California. I said, not happening. He said, what did you say? I said, I'm not doing it. He said, are you saying no to me? I said, Kevin, I got 15 matches under my belt. I don't know nothing. You want me to go in front of 60,000 pounds and look like a clown? I said, no, but I'll tell you what I will do. I said, if you would just permit me to do Raw here in Calgary on March 28, 2001, when you guys are in Calgary just before September 11th, he said, I'll do better than that. I said, what's better than that? He goes, you can do Tuesday night heat in Edmonton the next night. I said, oh my God. So I get to the show with, um, there's 11 of us debuting that day um, uh, before a dark, a dark, doing a dark match before Raw. And McFly and Leo the Legend Burke came down there with me. Leo, as you know, he used to train, uh, be the coach at Brett's place for WCW and WWF back in the day. And I love the man. Oh, we lost him for a second. Oh, he's back. We, we back? lost you for about five seconds. You were just talking about Leo Burke. And and while he's getting hooked back up, fans, uh, oh, here he is. Hi, Hassan. Yes, I don't think they're getting the picture, but I'm not answering calls right now. But... Uh... Oh, you're you're frozen. I don't know if it's because somebody's calling you, but you're Someone's frozen. calling me, and they're not. They just keep. That's like four or five times they called. Um, so uh, uh, Leo Burke comes down there with me because I was nervous, and I asked him to come down, and and he was teaching me psychology, and and, and yeah, I was working for Leo down at the Cecil uh, downtown. Me and McFly, and McFly brought me down there, and he says uh, to Leo, he says, Leo, this is my friend Ali, and he wants to learn psychology from you. Uh, if you would, you know, teach him psychology, because uh, I was getting all the, you know, technical stuff in the ring from from Ted, and and, uh, and he says, yeah, sure, put on an apron, you're my new waitress, <laughs> and I became, I became Leo's waitress. So um, and uh, so he comes down there, and I guess he goes. And now I had heard this after the fact, but he says to Kevin, he said, listen, man, this this kid doesn't know what he's doing. Um, he says he's green. Uh, I, he puts on a good show, but let him, you know, put him in his comfort zone. Let him wrestle McFly. And McFly was not debuting that day. He uh, ended up at WCW. But uh, uh, because Leo went over there when that whole Brett thing, uh, he says, let him uh, go over, uh, let him be the baby, and let him come out second. So about five minutes before the match, I walk up to Kevin Kelly and I'm like, hey, Kevin, God, what, what gives? I see Stone Cold Steve Austin reading his script in the corner. Where's my script? He says, no script. I said, well, so he goes, you go out there and wrestle. And I said, well, who am I wrestling so I can work? You know, and he says, you'll find out in the ring. 
I kid you not, brother. I don't remember a single spot in that match. I don't remember a single spot. I remember walking to the ring and getting off the mat. And that was it. Like I was so nervous. So I'm sure I just did an awful, awful job. But, you know, a lot of the fans had watched me here at the Fire Park with WCEW and, and you know, Wrestling for Bad News, God Rest His Soul, and um, and uh, and with Rick Titan and stuff, God Rest Their Souls. Uh, and so... Rick Titan, for anyone that doesn't know, was the, the fake Razor Ramon that I know you were close with. Yeah, 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 he died just recently, too. Um, but, uh, so... <clears throat> We finish the match, he goes over, he gets out of the ring, and as I start to get off the mat, the arena erupts. Ali, I was like, I mean, I, you can't even explain that. I mean, you know, and I come into the dressing room and I love this man, and you know what the kid, what kills me is that he doesn't know how much I love him, and I've loved him for the last 20 years, but Haku was sitting in the dressing room and he throws up his hands and yells, Ali! Man, I thought I was home. I get up to Edmonton, I look on the board and all of my colleagues' names are on that board except mine. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. I, they don't even wanna see me, that's how bad I was. So I run up to Kevin Kelly, and my, you know, I get up, I walk up to him, I said, Kevin, I shake his hand. I said, I want to thank you for this opportunity. If I never wrestle again, it was the highlight of my life. He says, what's wrong? I said, my wife had a miscarriage and I'm not going to hang out here like some mark if I'm not needed tonight. He said, whoa. He said, have you been paid for yesterday and today? I said, yeah. He said, well, the reason why you're not working tonight is because we've seen enough. Vince wants to see you please head over to his office. I'm like, this is surreal, man. This isn't happening. This isn't happening. So I rip home, sat down my wife, Shadia, and she used to come out with me as Princess Jasmine. You remember with the armed guards around her? It's just, what a great woman. 30 years I've been with this lady. She's given me five children. Um, and by God's permission. And I tell her, you're not going to believe this. They want to sign me. I, I, get my college and my pilot's license and send it off to the U.S. immigration. And I kid you not, brother, I kid you not, as I live and breathe, two planes fly into the World Trade Centers. And I, I'm sitting there watching the news going, oh my God. And I knew it. I knew it right then and there. My parents are Lebanese. I was born in Edmonton, made no difference. Pilot's license. My name is Ali. I knew it. Sure enough, around December, middle of December, I get my paperwork back. Denied entry. Reason? They had one word, four letters, four letters in capital. None. That was the reason. There was no reason. So, you know, I work in oil and gas now. And uh, as well as uh, various other things, but I started to ask around, and you know, my white Caucasian friends uh, said to me, "When that happened, when that tragedy of September 11th happened, we, um, you know, seventh generation Caucasians, were kicked out of the state suit too." So I didn't take it personally, but at the time. Hannibal, man, to have the rug pulled out from under you like that, I was like, wow. But in hindsight, in hindsight, I got five kids. I'm a bigger celebrity than anybody in the WWE. And I got five fans every single day, no matter what, when I wake up and when I go to bed. And rather than having reached that level of stardom that I that I felt that I could accomplish with the right guidance and the right platform. Um, I get to now, I get to see these little SOBs, every one of them debut, get their tryout with a local indie and then go on to the big show. And, you know, um, and we've been fortunate enough to touch a lot of the stars that you see today, uh, either through our facility or through our coaching staff who, um, 
Um, and it's just what a pleasure, right? And you know, and coaches they don't like to give you their their secret, uh, you know, that the, their show stoppers. To me, I'm I, you know, we have kids classes as well, and uh, and I teach these kids to be little beasts. I say, hey, don't you ever take someone off the rope without giving them two knees first. Don't you ever pick somebody up without softening up with a nice shot before you pick them up. Um, uh, and uh, some things that just, so when the fans are watching, they're like, wow, this is incredible. Everything is real. The way it would be done on the street if two guys were throwing down. And, and it's just exciting. So I like to give them the, the alley-oops and the, the sandstorm suplex and the stomp and the, the moves that, uh, you know, even guys like TJ, when I talk to me, says, Ali, don't think I, I, I don't remember your, you know, and he named some of the, you know, the cannonball off the top ropes, the suicide bomber. And I was like, wow, you remember some of it? And he goes, oh, and how you would do that, your hip toss to your belly. Or, uh, and I was like, holy smokes, man, that 20 years ago, you still remember that? He said, yeah. Um, so, uh, and another dear friend of ours, uh, TJ, just deserves everything he's getting in life. He's so successful. But, you know, you know, when I see him on Facebook, he's, he answers the the nobodies, the the kid that just, you know, 14, 16 years old, has nothing to do with wrestling, just a fan. And I see him on Facebook answering him and 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 I thought, wow man, you stayed humble through all that success and all that money and your wife's a star and your in-laws are stars and you're a star and it just wow, I I got it. What can I say, man? I think it's funny that out of everybody, everyone always imagined when we were younger that it was going to be Ted or Harry, the most successful. But as a wrestler, it was Natty. And as a producer, it was TJ behind the scenes. But no one would have expected uh, Natty to be one of the top divas of all time. Oh, I, I mean, but look at her. She's a gem. She's a freaking gem. I mean, and I love him. You know, I owe, I owe everything to them. What can I say? I mean, if Ted didn't have the courage to come up to me on the basketball court outside one sunny day uh, uh, in that at that gym, I mean, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. So, I mean, I love him. Uh, TJ's a dear friend, and uh, I wish him all, and Natty, and uh, Harry. I mean, Harry's here working out all the time. His cousins, uh, Thomas and uh, Mark, uh, the Billington uh, uh, boys are here all the time. Uh, you got to get some meat onto those two. <laughs> I know, eh? <laughs> but that's but that's so talented. But hey, listen, you know this, Hannibal. You got to take this business serious. It's it's mind and body. It's not just you know you have all of these tools in your toolbox and uh, these in your bag of tricks and uh, and just kind of you know nah. You gotta. I think you gotta you know. And I don't mean you got to be a pro bodybuilder. I mean, just hit the gym, and, and then they do. But they're just they're lean, and and but they look good. Who cares? They look good, man. <laughs> yeah, they're they're signed to MLW. But you you brought up Ted. I know you guys are back friends now. But he recently did a a podcast on this channel where he said the only wrestler that he ever fought was was CM Punk. I wasn't there for this, but it was about twenty years ago. You and Ted actually had a real fight um, on an Indian reserve around the time you were making this TV show. So what exactly happened there? Because I never asked you about it. You know, um, uh, and Ted's just that kind of guy. He just brings out your, you know, he just brings out emotion in people. Um, and uh, and I love the guy. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was like 20 years ago. It was a kid. You know, we were we had this hundred thousand square foot facility on Satina, um, and uh, called the C twenty building, where we produced our uh, the UWN uh, Underground, the Ultimate Wrestling Nation uh, TV series, and uh, we were at the facility. We were setting up and you know getting ready for the taping and stuff. And you know, um, let's just say we had a difference of opinion, um, and. You know he was he's such a has such a strong personality and he and he just you know he's so articulate um and uh and and i'm you know i've got a kind of a pretty aggressive personality and it was immediate it was immediate like we looked at each other and we realized that we had both we had both pushed each other uh to that point and just like without 
no warning, no nothing, just started shot for shot. And, you know, back then I was a big dude, 240, 250 pounds. Not a little old man like I am now. And, and you know, Ted wasn't like juiced up like he is now and thick and good. And, um, and he went shot for shot. And I was like, wow. I couldn't believe it because I wouldn't have fought me at that time. And, uh, and then I think both of us realized that <laughs> neither one of us was going to stop throwing shots. And it wasn't like we had grabbed each other. It was just shot for shot. Uh, hockey style without the uh, without the uh, grabbing of the of our jerseys, and uh, and then we immediately just both looked at each other and realized, okay, you know, we, we we let it out. And then one of his friends was over there. He had a couple of students with him because he was still training down at BJ's gym. And one of them made a move towards me, and God forgive me because he's such a nice kid. And I turned my attention from Ted and Beeline for this guy. And he started running away from me, realizing that I was coming at him. And he was started running towards me. We had a limousine inside of the building. And I'd come up behind him with an elbow on his knee. Boom, man, that kid went into that limousine. And the, <laughs> he actually pushed in the, the quarter panel there of this uh, older style limousine. And then I turned around and walked straight up to Ted and without even skipping a beat we just grabbed each other and hugged and squashed it um it was as as quickly as it had we had ignited it was over and um i'll tell you he's been nothing but uh but amazing to me over the years and uh, you know i know i i seen that you know dangerous breed in that documentary and stuff about him and the way he's portrayed and hey i'll tell you something um inhibition out the window and out partying, enjoying ourselves, training, wrestling. Um, I got to know Ted personally and intimately, and, you know, on a business level and on a personal level. I never seen nothing, never once seen anything that resembles the character that they tried to portray in that video. Bullshit, as far as I'm concerned. Never once did he yell or scream or freak out at a at a chick, whether it was in the club or, or in the gym or just, I, I'm just saying, I never once seen it. Never said, whoa, that kid's psycho. Just thought he was too talented for his own good, you know, and that's it. And he was given, you know, they say that you can take your shot too soon. Like uh, Steve, Steve Rivers. Um, I mean, his first match was for the WWF. So I think Ted got his shot too soon. He was too young. He was too good. And he knew it. And that was the problem. The SOB knew it. And it's true. I mean, Coach Raj here says, uh, we were, uh, I actually was talking to Ted the other day and Raj uh, uh, pulled up to trade. And I said, what do you, uh, I said, what did I say Raj said about you behind your back? He said, best wrestler, bar none, no questions. No questions. So, now we've we've seen the other two that were featured in this documentary were escorts. One, I guess, ran an escort business. The other was an escort. A lot of people say the Samantha Fiddler was was a stripper and also an escort. Did you ever meet this woman at all? No, no. I had um, because I I gone over to Lebanon and uh, started training some of the guys over there, and then I ended up in Saudi Arabia um, uh, for about four years and then uh, opened a facility in Dubai. Um, so, uh, uh, and he was in the States too, right? So we kind of were just, you know, Facebook highs and buys and stuff like that. I wasn't really involved or uh, never met her anyhow. No, I never, never met them. And speaking of your Middle East, I have about a 20 second clip to, to show people you were on the American Gladiators Middle Eastern version. So I'm just gonna put this up to show people your fighting skills, you're not all talk. <laughs> And we 
timed out. I mean, he timed out. I had to throw him off the platform. Uh, but that was, you know, it's called the Arab Gladiators, but uh, in essence, it was the American Gladiators done in the Middle East. But what a pleasure. That was at the time, the same time that my TV series aired on LBC, the Lebanese Broadcast Corporation, which is where we're going to open our next facility in Lebanon, actually, for a lot of the Middle Eastern and uh, Indian and uh, Nepalian and Bangladesh and Pakistani, Nigerian um, uh, uh, wannabe uh, uh, sports entertainers that can't get visas to come to our facility here. Uh, we're starting to, try, starting to attract a large international uh, audience for our training. And uh, so uh, so we're going to go open another one in, in Lebanon, hopefully this summer. Now, I remember I was part of your, your TV show pilot there all those years ago. Bad News Allen was, was one of the commentators. Could you tell us at all about your relationship with him over the years? Because you guys seem really close. You know what? I just love the man. And I love the fact that I got the last series that he ever produced so i have that footage of him and that footage is so dear to me and uh and uh, second razor well not the fake the second razor remote rick titan um uh was also the color commentator he was the heel and he was so funny oh my god he said such stuff that today you'd be ousted you just couldn't say it but i mean it was just so funny the way because we were you know i knew he was joking and stuff and uh but uh I mean, they were just and and bad news was the was the baby and, and obviously Rick was the heel because uh, you know he just he just loved to rib me, um, but uh, and then Tim Stein and uh, Jinder Mahal was in that and you remember Phil Lafont and uh, Rob McManus the Highlander and uh, Vic Viper and who else? Uh, um, uh, Steve. It, it was it ended up it was an elimination tournament and it ended up being me and Steve. Rivers in the main event, uh, Canada, uh, uh, USA versus Lebanon. So it was, it was, it was pretty awesome. And you know, to have footage of Jinder when he was a, just a little punk kid, uh, you know, making a hundred bucks a match uh, back in the day, and now look at him, man, the guy won't even answer your call. He's such a big star. Yeah, I mean, there's another guy we talked about, Natty, being kind of the dark horse. Ra I kind of always knew Raj was going to make it because of his size. And he's a good politician, let's face the fact, but he's he's talented too. I always liked wrestling him. But no oh, one wrestled him. expected him to eclipse like Ted's success. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you wrestled him. I never had the pleasure of wrestling him. Uh, you know what else too? I've never wrestled Ted. And uh, I mean, just I would just love to, you know, to come off that top rope with Cannonball and finish that fight uh, 20 from 20 years ago. But uh, I never wrestled Ted. And I don't think I ever wrestled you either, Hannibal. No, only in the, only in the training because by the time I was there, you, you after that WWE thing, I think you kind of threw in the towel on wrestling. You still hung around and did your own your own pilots and stuff, but you didn't do the stampede stuff at that point. You know what I said? I thought to myself, if those pricks are going to keep me out of the states for what? For you know what I mean, like. It was just such a such an odd thing to have happen at that time. The timing of it. Uh, I said, you know what? If I can't go to the WWE, then and uh, I said, or not the WWE. I can't go to the states, right? So I can't work for these guys. So you know. So but I kept training. I kept uh, uh, having uh, being involved in performance centers and training centers, and and finally got got to meet like uh, you know Chris Knight, the Aussie legend, and and Raj. You know, I knew Raj from back in the day when me and his dad Gamma were going to South Africa for a month, a month long tour. And I got to, you know, tag with, you know, like he's Hulk Hogan uh, over there. Uh, you know, that was just such an honor to, to be able to share in that with his dad. So kid, Raj was always like, a lot younger than, than I was. Uh, but uh, now he, he's here at the Performance Center. I was on impact, my... right? Just for the fan. I forget what his impact name is because I don't get it. But uh... Raj Singh, Raj Singh, okay. yeah. And uh, and I walked in one day. I remember one day uh, he had we had two groups of kids in both rings. He had about maybe eight or ten guys in each ring, and he had blown out his knee at Impact still where he is now. And uh, he had his he had the uh, his chair leaned up against the the windows 
uh, and his foot up on and he had this device or on his knee and he was you know he took his therapy real serious and he had his leg up on the ring and he was and i said Raj, how the heck you're coaching two groups of people from a chair lean back while you're you know recovering with this huge you know meniscus injury and uh, and i said i don't understand how you are such an amazing coach and he said to me he says ali i've had my own ball hockey league for about 15 years i've been coaching for 15 years and he's just a kid um and and i thought wow but wow what an amazing coach who wasn't trained as a coach but being trained by bad news you know which he was him and gender i mean you're being taught everything a to z i mean that's I mean, king kong let's go back to the olympics where he got robbed right um so that's uh that's raj uh i just and i love him i i love him he says to me oh you didn't have a debut wwe raw and i said no i didn't it was a dark match on raw he said no you know you're the next star so. and he's like ribbing me about it and i'm like listen you punk and and uh, but just I love the man and he just he's a that's what i call him raj the rib sing because everything that comes out of that guy's mouth is a rib yeah and and i can tell the fans there is i guess you could call me a wrestling expert i truly believe if you had had a shot in wwe you would have made it from seeing your intensity and your charisma and your look yeah you, ha you have a fan here that wants to know if you have any advice for mustafa ali who seems to be struggling to get over in WWE right now? Oh, geez. I mean, what can you say to a star without sounding like, a, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know, man. Um, I was always an intense, I like, there was no off with me in the ring. You know what I mean? And sometimes I see these workers that turn it on and turn it off. And when you're on that platform, I mean, off should just not be an option. You know what I mean? I, yeah. And I mean, I don't know how to say it without showing you, but you know what I'm talking about. There's, with me, there was no off. There was no walking over and picking somebody up. I grabbed him by his head. I pulled his head towards me and I give him a slap that he'd remember the next day. So there was no just picking a guy up or walking up without giving him a shot, softening him up, or giving him a couple of knees before you took him off the ropes. Um, so, uh, but today, I don't know, man. So we try to bring that into it, that showmanship, that intensity, that charisma, that engagement, that audience engagement. That, hey, man, get it out of your head. This has nothing to do with pro wrestling. This uh, Pro wrestling has nothing to do with wrestling. This is about sports entertainment. And I'll tell you why. Because you could do a full match without a single wrestling move. So then what does this have to do with wrestling? Absolutely nothing. Wrestling is the resistance of one competitor against another. What we do is the assistance of one worker working with another. Because some of our moves look like amateur wrestling moves, let me tell you, if any of these fans were interested in wrestling, they'd wait four years for the Olympics. But do they? No, they do not. So stop telling me that pro wrestling is about wrestling. And if you're interested in becoming a wrestler, then this is not the place for you. But if you wanna put on a performance and you wanna be a sports entertainer, then don't sing it, just bring it. <laughs> Good advice. There, there's another fan on here. You mentioned your jujitsu background with Terry and jujitsu here and kickboxing with John Eve Terrio, who I train with as well. No but, way. Uh, this guy wants to know your thoughts on the Gracie Barra gyms all over the world. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not involved in that uh, anymore, but uh, so I, I, I really don't have an opinion. So I don't want to just kind of say something to appease a fan. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar, bro. And there's another fan that coincidentally says he also trains at those uh, those Gracie gyms, but he says he wants to become a pro wrestler, but he has autism. Any advice for him? You know, we get uh, we we do birthday parties here in June. We have kids that are limited mobility and autistic, and and, and some 
difficulties and you know um, we, we we allow them to participate in our program whether they're an adult or the uh, you know over 16 or under 60 um, to whatever they're able to do and you can't say no to anybody you know you you never know um, who's gonna make it and who isn't because um, this is an equal opportunity business right as long as if you're missing a, a finger or a nose or an arm or uh, or what have you uh, but you put on a show you put on a show and that's all they're looking for um, so I mean I can't how can you say no to anybody you know and we've had some you know some students with some challenges and participated and enjoyed it and 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 did uh, their debut match and and they'll have that forever and some of them have continued on and some of them have not uh but the experience from the from the communications that we still have is like they were grateful for their time here because they learned and they grew as a person and started and, and maybe understood uh, people better and, and and had more respect you know when you're putting your life in somebody's hands and vice versa you you have another level of respect for humanity i think uh, because it's you know life is so fragile and you see it uh, when we put our, you know, when we when we perform for you and we put that blood and sweat into into what we do. I Ivan wants to know if you've ever met Tiger Jeet Singh. Tiger Jeet Singh? No, I don't think yeah. so. He was the uh, the father of Tiger Ali Singh. That was a, a Japanese wrestler, but he's he's from the other end of Canada. Who's that? Who's that? Um, uh, that. Japanese superstar Tiger, um, Tiger Mask. Uh, Tiger Mask. Uh, that when I I went down with Ted uh, to AAA for a pay per view and came out uh, in the uh, uh, after the main event with Conan and X Pac and and Bobby Lashley and and <laughs> you know I'll tell you something I swear to God this is a true story you know uh, my editor calls me and he's like. Holy smokes! You did a show with uh, Daniel Bryan in uh, Mexico with uh, trip for Triple I said no. I said Bobby Lashley, Conan, X Pac, Ted was there. I think Jack was there too. This Tiger Mask superstar. I, I didn't know him. Um, and uh, he he says yeah, and Daniel Bryan. I said no. He said I'm watching. I'm looking at the footage, and he sends me a clip of me with my headscarf and my robe walking out beside him. I swear to God, man, I didn't even know who he must have went by a different name back then. But I didn't even know uh, know that it was uh, realized that it was him. So uh, oblivious. I mean, too many chairs to the head. Come on, you remember? I mean, Bill. I remember one time, Bill. I said to him, man, I'm not feeling good today. And they said, no, no, Al, you got to wrestle. And it was WCEW. No, no, you're you're the big star, and all your the, uh, your fans have come out. And I said, I'm not feeling good. Please, Bill. And I'm telling you, he hit me with a chair. All I could see was eight people like this. And, you know, back then, I didn't know to, you know, I just took that boom. Oh, my God. So if I ever run into Bill again, I love him, too, because, I mean, it was that match that got us the, our debuts. But, um, yeah, I have too many chairs to the head, bro. What can I tell you? Now, I don't think you probably want to get into this too much, but you were showing me the pictures of this beautiful facility you had in, Dubai, which was was immaculate, and I guess you got screwed over there or something, which is unfortunate. Um, but how was that experience? Just briefly, uh, trying to get something started in Dubai. You know, we had a we had a. I went down there. Um, a friend of mine had told me that there was an opportunity there, and some you know some of the VIPs wanted to meet me. I guess they called. They're rich and wealthy down there, VIPs. And uh, so I went down there. We ended up uh, meeting uh, the Crown Prince's uh, consultant, Nasser Niyadi. He's the guy that started Skydive Dubai, and he's the one that really uh, has made paddleball big over there and uh, just a, a gem of a human being. Came on as our agent, and we launched the, um, the Ultimate Wrestling Nation. Over there, we had two rings over at Fitness for Life uh, gym, about a 34,000 square foot gym with two swimming pools and, and um, a full track on the second floor. It was just an incredible, incredible facility, um, state of the art. And um, my head coach from here at the time, yeah, there you go. Uh, no, that's, that's, <laughs> that's actually the, 
the uh, that's the screw job picture. So um, uh, yeah, that's that's after what they turned it to the UWN United Wrestling Nation. So to make a long story short, um, we launched. We got you know twenty five million from five investors in the United States to start running live shows across the Middle East and you know and there's the track yeah um, and then uh, you know I Kenny Lester a friend of mine uh, another gem of a human being uh, got me in touch with some of the big dogs you know like uh, um, Kurt Angle and uh, we reached out to uh, uh, Eric Bischoff and had uh, discussions with him and Mark Henry and Mojo Riley and Damian Sandow and um, uh, Chuck Liddell and Mike Tyson's team and uh, yeah, there's the two rings from the second from the restaurant up top and uh, Henry Cejudo and uh, Triple C and Eric Albaracin uh, was they were um, uh, Talking to Mike Tyson's camp and who was really interested in getting involved in pro wrestling in the Middle East and then uh, about six months into the project and just waiting on funding I came back to Canada to um yeah and this is difficult uh but i came back to canada and uh my ceo my marketing manager and my head coach from here who all will remain nameless um decided why don't we just start the united wrestling nation kick ali's ass out the door and we'll become owners instead of employees good on you so after and you know it was so embarrassing you know, you know it was so embarrassing that i i how do you you know when they when they pulled the carpet out from under me um how do you call kurt angle and say i just got my ass handed to me or mark henry who took the time to even say hello to a nobody like me it was so disheartening that so many people were relying on that in 20 years of my life you know invested in in one day that was my goal is to one day go to the middle east and have a promotion running across the middle east in, in that territory that they don't really have you know a, a larger organization so so many people that were relying on it that lost out and, and then they ended up they ended up that group of guys uh who you know um ended up getting an investor a Syrian investor and and this is from my CEO's brother's mouth who was my best friend back from Ottawa from I've known these guys for th almost 30 years which was even worse at insult to injury but his brother ended up uh, talking to me afterwards and saying um, that they got an investor for 12 million he got the first million payment uh, buddy went out and bought a Maserati and gave the coach a 50,000 bonus and the secretary $20,000 bonus and this big fancy offices and started bringing in uh, shipping girls over from uh, Lebanon uh, to work in the office I don't know why but um, and then married some 25 year old uh, young girl and um, and you know going to coffee shops for $20 US for a cup of tea and you know went through that money pretty quick and then went back to the investor for a, uh, a second payment of three million I think it was total 12 is what buddy was gonna invest and and like I said this is all secondhand from his brother though I mean it's uh, reliable as far as I'm concerned and he said to the investor you know give us a second payment and he looks at him and he must have said something like are you out of your mind I just watched you spend a million dollars of my money and not put on a show and walked out and then so the pictures that I sent you was our facility originally and then somebody stole one of our rings and then they changed the logo on the wall from ultimate wrestling nation to UWN and uh, and then in the final picture there that I sent you you see that there's no rings and it's too bad too we had about 15 students and we had just opened up but we had students from all over like it was just uh, you know because we had good coaches and I mean I can't say anything bad about the, the, the his uh, my former coaches coaching um, you know is reputable I've been in the business 40 years uh, and he I mean he's seen an opportunity and he took it and you know what they say greed begets you know and I guess they got greedy and uh, but uh, in the end they got what they deserved and that which is nothing 
you know, and now that coach doesn't even have a job, you know, so, uh, but yeah, it was unfortunate. So how can people contact you about uh, your Calgary location? And I guess Lebanon, you're still finalizing everything there. So you're not really plugging that too much yet. Well, we ship, we, I shipped the ring, uh, a couple of rings down there already. And um, so we just got to, we're going to set that up hopefully this summer, maybe sooner, but let's, let's see. Uh, but over here, we're, we're still in our head offices in Calgary, Alberta. The Workforce Fitness Performance Center, you can go WFPC.ca or just uh, Google the best uh, training center in Canada. And uh, for some reason, ours has been, have been coming up. And I mean, not due to me, bro, like Chris, uh, I mean, Chris Knight, Raj Singh, Mo, Mo, Mo Chocolate. I mean, you, you can ask for better. I mean, they, and they don't just teach the kids spots and moves. They, they teach them, they make them understand the business. They make them understand what they need to do, the respect that they need to have, um, you know, uh, etiquette, uh, you know, uh, it's, I'm telling you, it's, it's something to be seen. And we have a lot of students that have been kind of in the, over the last month, been coming to us from other schools within the area that have said, listen, man, we made a mistake. We went to this place because of you know, money, and if you if you're looking for a good deal, I, I can recommend half a dozen uh, facilities in and around Calgary. But if you're looking to get trained properly and to take this business seriously, then uh, then we'll take your money. Yeah, one of the problems with wrestling, and and it's out here too on the on the East Coast. There's there's like so many crappy schools, and then independent leagues. That, that use these wrestlers that put on such horrible shows, it kind of kills the, the independent scene around. So uh, hopefully more people will, will go to schools like yours and, and see the difference when you have, have known trainers and, and such a top-notch facility. And it'll eventually make the independent scene stronger out there. Well, I mean, I, you know, the, the thing is, is and, and, and we've talked about this before, um, they, you know, these schools have promotions and they and they and they they convince these kids that they're going to be put in a match at the end of the three months and they are put in a match. Uh, does it mean that they're they should have been in a match? Um, so watch out for that, you know, and, I, and they've asked me, they said, Ali, you know, you're you're, you know, you're pretty creative and, you know, the Ultimate Wrestling Nation was the first ever professional wrestling full contact prize fight in the never seen before octagon ring with ropes. Um, and, uh, you know, it was it was like, you know, it was hard hitting. And um, so they say, start do it, start a promotion. I don't want I don't want to confuse the two issues. Promoting is promoting. Training is training. I'm, I want to produce. I want to. We want to produce superstars, sports entertainers that can work for anybody. Not just because you spent three months and you know missed every second day and then got put in a match at the end of your training program. Come on, man. If this is what you're looking for, man, hit the road because we're not looking for that. We're not looking for people that just want to be thrown into a show. We're looking for people that want to take this seriously and want to make something of themselves through this vehicle called professional wrestling. And it looks like a lot better. Uh, I know the dungeon is like legendary, but like that was a mat with no ropes and cat piss on the mat and, and weights from like the 1950s. Uh, and and your, your place there is like 2020 and beyond. It's, it looks like absolutely amazing. You know, TJ had contacted me uh, a number of years ago, said, you know, Ali, uh, I know you can't come to the States, but what do you think about... Uh, coming to Saudi Arabia and doing a show down there. This was just before COVID and me and Torn, uh, Torn Hart, Bruce Hart's uh, kid, were, uh, were uh, practicing and we we're going to do a match and send it to the WWE just, to, you know, for him to, to be seen and, and maybe possibly for me to go do some stuff in the Middle East. And, um, and I was uh, talking to TJ and I FaceTimed him and I said, have a look. And I showed him, and this was like, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, so it isn't the facility that it is today. And uh, I'll never forget this. He says to me, he says, and I walked him through the whole building and showed him, and he says to me, Ali, next to the WWE Performance Center, that is the best facility I've ever seen. And I was like, wow, wow. 
I mean, you know, it's it's full service, right? So um, that was really nice to hear from him. Uh, and then to see his garage, the way he painted his garage with all the, some of the stuff that I have up on the walls, you know, was, uh, the, and he has more right to have it up on his walls, but we're just honored. Um, but uh, to see his garage kind of done up kind of a little bit like the inside of my facility was kind of cool. Um, yeah, because he's training people in Florida now too. But yeah. I appreciate you coming on and, and telling us about your facility. Hopefully some some wrestlers from Canada and elsewhere will, will see it and consider it if they're considering getting into wrestling. But I'll let you close this off with uh, whatever you want to tell the fans and whatever you want to plug. And nice chatting with you again. Yeah, the pleasure is all mine. You know, it's been a long time since I've seen you, so I enjoy our conversations, and I hope to come back and chat with you again. Uh, you know, to the guys out there that are looking to get trained, just, you know, be careful. Make sure that it has everything, the facility has everything that you're looking for, that uh, the coaches are reputable and they're actually mentioned, <laughs> and that they've they've trained people that have, have, have become something. So, you know, they say the proof is in the pudding. Uh, that's all. I mean, we're not the end. I'm not saying we're the best. Um, uh, we're we're being told that we're we're getting there, uh, and uh, and we keep evolving the 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 sport. You know, we keep evolving the move to because the fight scene that you used to enjoy in 1950, John Wayne, is not the Matrix fight scene that you're seeing today. So we had to evolve some of the things that we do to make it more, you know, um, uh, fan friendly. Uh, but uh, yeah, just do your homework. Otherwise, you know, they're all great facilities. Uh, they all, a lot of them have amazing coaches, better than ours, uh, but just do your homework before you. And if you do um, want to have a look at our program, please go to wfpc.ca and uh, give us a call. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss.